Hey there, this is Mrs. Henry again. This is a continuation of the historical context for Of Mice and Men. So a number of things contributed to the economic downturn uh, for the Great Depression. And the Great Depression is the backdrop of the setting for Of Mice and Men. George and Lenny are the main characters of the book and they are migrant workers. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about um, the combination of factors that led to the challenges that faced people during the Great Depression. So first of all, there was a farming crisis. So after World War I ended, which was in 1918, European demand for the U.S. grown food dropped as farming in war-torn countries returned to normal, and the demand for American crops diminished. This caused the price of crops to plummet due to oversupply, and many farmers were left with substantial debt because if you'll remember, they purchased farm equipment and more acreage in preparation for meeting this, the, the demand for World War I, and um, that demand ended. And so now they had all this extra acreage and all this farming equipment. In addition to that, there was a terrible drought. Um, the U.S. had not experienced drought since the 1890s, and that was long enough ago in the 1930s and the early 30s for people to forget just how bad it was. So the weather um, started, there was no rain for many, many, many weeks. So this video here is going to talk about the environmental catastrophe that contributed to what is known as the Dust Bowl. There was no rain at all in Cimarron County, Oklahoma in March of 1933. The agricultural agent there predicted that at best, farmers might harvest four bushels of winter wheat per acre versus the previous yields of nearly 30. And now the dust storms were becoming more frequent. Instead of the 14 storms of 1932 classified as the worst, there were 38 in 1933. One storm in April lasted 24 hours. You could hardly avoid looking to the west to see if you could see this rim of dust that was rising on the horizon. It was earth colored, way far away, right, uh, beginning to rise, and the next day perhaps it would be bigger and come, come quicker and higher. And then um, suddenly you were just engulfed. It was overhead and you couldn't see the sun. And that's when it was a really bad day. And day after day, it would be that way. Dark, black, scary. The experts could tell where the dust came from by the color. New Mexico had one color and Oklahoma coming from the other direction had another color and they would say well we're enjoying Oklahoma today well we're vi getting visited by all the New Mexicans today and so forth the big dust storms were, were fine particles of soil others were sandier blows that uh, blew along the highways at low elevation and it took, could take the paint off your automobile or your house, like sandpaper being rubbed against it. But the ones that were the most terrifying were the ones that were based on these very fine particles that rose up into the air at seven, 8,000 feet in this kind of boiling wall of dirt coming at you with gale force, 40, 50, 60 mile an hour winds. These are the black blizzards that frightened people so much during those periods. One of these dusters would approach from afar and they would see it for the first time it was like a mountain range because some cases the storms were 100 miles 150 miles 200 miles wide and a mile or more high so imagine driving on a flat land and looking off and seeing a mountain range itself starting to move daylight itself would be obliterated someone told me it was like two midnights in a jug one particularly bad storm we had it was in the daytime and it rolled in and it was so black that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face so we all gathered in the kitchen the whole family we lit the kerosene lamp and that didn't help very much and the mother had 
tea towels that were made out of flour sacks because we were also in the Great Depression. And we just took them and draped them over our head, down the face, you know, uh, just the whole head. You couldn't see anything. You sit there and, you know, you couldn't talk or visit with anybody very much, but uh, that wet towel would catch the dust. And sometimes those towels were pretty black by the time we took them off. It gets so bad you couldn't even see to drive. You couldn't see the sides of the road with your lights on. You couldn't tell whether you was on the road or on the sides or where you were. Sometimes we were caught in the house or in the car, and we just sat there until it all blew over. It just was old brown dirt blowing all around the car, and we just sat there until it kind of cleared up enough he could see the road to go on to get to the house. And it was gritty and dirty, and you had to wash your mouth off whenever you got in the house so you weren't eating dirt. If you'd go out and pick up a handful of dirt and stick it in your mouth, that's just the way it would feel. One of the things that happened just before a duster hit was there was this amazing static electricity in the air. And so people used to carry a chain in their car to ground the electricity. So you didn't drive anywhere without having this chain that you'd then throw out and drag it along the ground to ground the electricity. Because your radio would go out, your electrical stuff would short. And every person would talk about how you literally couldn't shake another person's hand before one of these dusters because the static was so strong. It was the kinetic energy that was in the air just before a duster hit. I can remember feeling it in my hair. It just uh, kind of like your head tingles or something, you know. Uh, your hair just kind of wiry. More dust and the longer the ride, the higher the charge. Until finally it gets such a powerful charge that uh, if you reach out to touch a car, the uh, electricity will jump out about six inches to meet you and knock you right flat on your butt. But it wasn't always like that. Don't forget this is a storm, which means it had a beginning and an end. And in between storms, couldn't be more beautiful. These skies were crystal blue and the clouds were those puffy white summertime clouds without a drop of water in 50 of them. But I can still remember my father looking up at the sky and praying that, that the rain would actually it never would because we weren't, weren't rain cows and never would be. In the times between storms, the farmers and townspeople tried their best to carry on with their lives. But the land they called home was being rearranged before their very eyes. Oh, just dirt, piles of dirt around anything like the fence rows or uh, something like a plow implement or anything out in the yard. It might be nearly covered up with dirt. Anything loose banked up around something or blew away. It would drift up the side of the barn, so you could walk up on the roof of the barn. You know, you just walk up uh, like you had a ladder there, but it would be dirt. The storms had pushed dried up Russian thistles, tumbleweeds, across the open ground by the hundreds of thousands. Wherever they piled up against barbed wire fences, they created eddies in the wind, and the dirt accumulated. Thistles got in the fence, and then the sand got in the thistles. So consequently, what cattle was still alive walked over the fence. Every place there was a fence, you could almost walk over most of them. Where the dirt and sand hadn't piled up, the land had been swept clean of topsoil. It was bare. It was hard. You could take a broom and sweep it just like you could a wood floor. It was hard, just like cement. So you could walk out on your farm, and instead of finding dirt, you found this hard pan layer on the top, impossible to cultivate. Your dirt would be in somebody else's farm or a county away. You know, the dust was so bad that the cattle died. They found small herds of cattle that were just 
filled up with dirt in their lungs and their noses. I can remember seeing our cows' noses that were just mud on the end where they tried to breathe and couldn't. They died of suffocation. Whatever wildlife was out there died of suffocation. But animals also simply wandered away, not knowing where they belonged, and would climb over these dust drifts and be lost. So it was really devastating for livestock in terms of loss of life. Housewives nurtured their gardens with well water. But the abrasive winds, the shifting dirt, even sometimes the charge of static electricity in the air, often killed the vegetables their families were counting on. A storm would come and there would be absolutely nothing left of it. And mother tried her best to keep that from happening. She would dig post holes to plant tomatoes in so that the wind wouldn't cut them off until they got bigger and stronger to where they might, might have some tomatoes then. And uh, she dug deep rows to put anything in. And of course, sometimes they would fill up with dirt. After surveying the residents of Meade, Kansas, a reporter calculated that the average damage from a single storm was $25 per home. What couldn't be measured, he said, was the loss of disposition of the housewives. My mother was very clean. Her house was always clean, and she tried to keep us kids clean. She would take all of her curtains down one day and wash them and hang them back up. A dirt storm would come in that night, and they were just like they were before she washed them. And that went on day after day after day. And once in a while, you would hear of some woman that just couldn't take it anymore, and she had committed suicide. It blew that dirt into the attic of the house. And a lot of times when we would get up in the morning, you could look up at the uh, ceiling, and if there was a split or between boards or whatever, that dirt would just be coming right down like this on the table. And when we'd get up in the morning, a lot of times there would be, say, from an inch to five inches of dirt just piled down like that. And you clean that off and you eat. And you eat the dirt if it's there. If it didn't, well, you do good. When we set the table, we always set the plate upside down, glasses or cups, whatever it was, upside down. And still, I think you'd turn them over and shake them, look at them before you put anything in them. My family thinks that I'm kind of stupid, and I guess I am. But I still, if I get a glass out of the cabinet, I rinse it out before I drink out of it. When we would go to bed at night, sometimes a dust storm would come in. And when we got up the next morning, our covers would be completely covered with dust. And the only pl clean place on our pillow would be where our head had laid. Dust to eat and dust to breathe and dust to drink. Dust in the beds and in the flower bin, on dishes and walls and windows, in hair and eyes and ears and teeth and throats, to say nothing of the heaped up accumulation on floors and windowsills after one of the bad days. This wind-driven dust, fine as the finest flower, penetrates wherever air can go. Okay, so that's a bit of information about some eyewitness accounts and some personal stories about what it was like to live during the Dust Bowl. So George and Lenny, the main characters of, um, of Mice and Men, are what is known as migrant workers. And um, a migrant worker is one that just travels around, doesn't really stay in one place for very long. Due to the economic situation of the time, farms were under huge financial pressure during the 1930s. On top of this, there was a severe drought and horrific dust storms, which made it hard for farmers in the southern Midwestern states to grow any crops. All of this resulted in many farmers and farm workers moving to Golden, California in hopes of finding work. Indeed, in the 1930s, roughly 1.3 million Americans 
moved from the Midwest and Southwest to California in search of work. So this kind of gets to the concept of the American dream. Americans were under deep financial distress, which caused challenges in other areas of their lives. And they had this hope and idealism that if they moved westward, they were going to perhaps seek fulfillment, find jobs, pick up where they left off, have a home for their families, and their dreams would be fulfilled. These workers were known as migrant workers, as I said. They moved around for the purposes of finding employment. They often led extremely transient lives. Transient means moving often. Uh, they never, never made enough money to really settle down and raise a family. Since so many moved to California, there weren't enough jobs or high enough wages to support the good fortune and opportunity that they hoped for. That was really the reality of their dreams. Demand for farm workers was really low, so farmers could pay as little as they wanted since everyone wanted a job. And that picture there on the bottom right is um, a billboard that is kind of really, it says from the Chamber of Commerce, which is the government of a town, saying, go home, we don't need you here, because they didn't have enough, um, they had too many workers for the jobs that were their own people, let alone people coming in from other towns. Hey, there was a graphic that kind of gives a timeline for the Dust Bowl. It was called the Dust Bowl because of kicking up the dust. Um, the indestructible buffalo grass ended up not being so indestructible. And since they didn't give their crops time to rest and their acreage time to kind of become more nutritionally dense um, soil, and um, it just it wasn't topsoil, it was just dust. They couldn't grow anything. And um, I'm sure you've heard of how the Great Plains is what they're called. The states that have very flat lands. It's also Tornado Valley, Tornado Country, because tornadoes can really pick up wind and, and land and cause quite a bit of damage, actually, um, because of the flat land. It makes sense, though, because these states, a flat land is great for growing farms and crops on them, but they also are susceptible to high winds and unique storms that we don't really experience here. So this graphic kind of shows you a little bit of a timeline starting in the, the 1930s, um, as much as 50% of all crops in Arkansas failed. And um, if you ever do any research on the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, they re a lot of people, eyewitness accounts, um, will talk about Black Sunday, which is known as the worst dust storm in American history. Um, you can see there that little kind of amoeba-like shape or structure. It actually covered the span of like six states, this dust storm. And just if you can imagine just how mammoth that is, that's a large area. Um, in 1936, in July, 12 states break their temperature records. And in 1939 to 1940, just as an example, Louisiana experiences 115 consecutive days of 90 degree temperatures. So that's astronomical. They weren't expecting a drought. They hadn't had one since the 1890s, but that happened in conjunction with all of these other um, things. And that's what contributed to the Great Depression. But there was hope that came in the form of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his plan for bringing people out of the Great Depression. So we're gonna watch this video that talks about the New Deal. In many towns, the names of families on relief were published each month in the local newspaper. In one county, 80% of the population now relied on some form of government assistance. These people were, were so needy and you felt so sorry for them. You might feel like giving them a dollar out of your own pocket, but you know, you just didn't do things like that. It's not professional. Fresh out of college at age 21, Dorothy Williamson was hired as a social worker trained by the federal government and dispatched to Prowers County in southeastern Colorado. She was assigned a 50 square mile territory and went from one dust ravaged farm to another. So we sat across the table and talked to each other. 
it was almost as if they were in the middle of something that they could see no way out. And that's why they looked so hopeless and also they looked stunned as if, can this really be happening? It kind of left me with a bad feeling too to have to go out there and see these people because you felt you were helping them what you could, but, but you really couldn't help them. But what they really needed was an inner thing that, that nobody could give them. They needed a, a, a trust again in something which they had lost. What help there was came from Washington now and the flood of New Deal programs President Roosevelt had created. The Civilian Conservation Corps put young men to work in national parks, state parks, and national forests, and paid them $30 a month, 25 of which they were required to send home to their families. Thousands of CCC workers were also dispatched to plant rows of trees up and down the Great Plains as potential windbreaks against the fierce dust storms. By the end of the decade, 18,600 miles of shelter belts with 217 million trees had been planted. The National Youth Administration, open to both boys and girls, let students remain at home and earn a little money through work-study projects. In Amarillo, Pauline Durrett Robertson was paid 25 cents an hour to grade papers. In Boyce City, Don Wells and his older brother stayed after school to help the janitor clean classrooms. As a bonus, he let them take showers in the locker room, a luxury for boys who lived in a chicken coop. In southwestern Kansas, Laureen White's mother received a pressure cooker from the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, and her father reluctantly enrolled with the Works Progress Administration the New Deal's biggest and most controversial program. My dad was a proud man. He didn't want anything to do with government programs. He thought he could handle it on his own. He found out later that he needed to take part in them. Dad worked on WPA, I think, about a year. And uh, they were building a bridge uh, not too far from home. It's a beautiful bridge, it's still there. During the depths of the depression, the WPA became the largest employer in the nation, creating 8 million jobs in virtually every corner of the country. The Prairie, once the home of the deer, buffalo, and antelope, one newspaper wrote, is now the home of the Dust Bowl and the WPA. Many people considered it make work, and a waste of money. It made a lot of difference on which side you were on. If you didn't have a job, they were boondoggles, do nothings, leaned on their shovels and got money for it. And so they resented it very much. But if you were the ones that had the shovel, it was the difference between starving and having food to eat. If we got paid enough it saved, it kept us alive. The WPA built a dam on Rita Blanca Creek near Dalhart, Texas, to create a reservoir and recreation area. In Union County, New Mexico, using only local materials, 6,000 of the 10,000 area residents found temporary employment working on a new high school that would still be in use three quarters of a century later. With my family, we would have starved to death uh, because we had no other way to make any money. The New Deal for us, the WPA in particular, was just a lifesaver for us. Most of our neighbors felt that way. Pauline Hodge's father helped build Highway 64 through the Oklahoma Panhandle. It passed within a few miles of Caroline Henderson's homestead. If mere dollars were to be considered, the actually destitute in our section 
could undoubtedly have been fed and clothed more cheaply than the works projects that have been carried out. But in our national economy, manhood must be considered as well as money. People employed to do some useful work may retain their self-respect to a degree impossible under cash relief. If we must worry so over the ruinous effects of made work on people of this type, why haven't we been worrying for generations over the character of the idlers to whom some accident of birth or inheritance has given wealth unmeasured, unearned, and unappreciated? So the Works Progress Administration, as a part of the New Deal, um, was an initiative by FDR. And interestingly, Dixie Heights High School, as well as Simon Kenton High School, were a part of the WPA. If you go to the old entrance um, on the front main hallway, you can see a plaque that discusses the WPA. And Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the first lady, was actually at the ribbon cutting, ribbon cutting ceremony um, for Dixie Heights High School. Okay, so that concludes this section of the historical context. The next video will be discussing documenting the Great Depression.